Hey folks, can we talk? Or can I just talk at you for a while? Uh, I'm not going to do the New Testament and Old Testament uh, context today. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, because in part, my uh, mind and my focus have been for, uh, seems like a number of days now, <laughs> mostly on from the a little while after I get up on uh, overseeing the development of two websites. One website is for the Obery Project, and it's hard to know uh, the best way to, to guide and direct the, the people that are doing it because it's, it's such new territory. You know, you're, you're trying to you're trying to communicate. You're trying to communicate certain concepts as best as you can. And you're trying at the same time, you, <laughs> you have to remember that not everyone is at the same place mentally and emotionally uh, and, and in every other way. Than, than everybody else is because everybody is in different stages all the time. So uh, I, I would probably, had I come across something like this, the information that will be uh, made available more and more at that website between papers, uh, usable charts, a, a lot of works in progress, and tools uh, that everyone is invited to use to try to figure out what the world is really like. <clears throat> Uh, so that's been a uh, that's a challenge. The other one is for my own personal business because I don't know. It seems like I have to uh, diversify a little and and hopefully get a better foothold in a certain uh, niche. I guess yeah. It's just it seemed like a good idea and. Um, I had for a couple of weeks I had just not been able to work um, from the guided a big part of it was from the guided biopsy that they did on me uh, on one of my lymph nodes in the really bad state of health in general in my whole body that followed that um, fortunately it really does seem like it's getting better uh, and not on its own so that's good that's I would probably want it to be getting better faster but mostly everything that that's worthwhile takes time so since I really haven't been able to to put uh, a lot of thought into that, uh, the New Testament quotes in Old Testament context, and I've been listening to some other folks as I can whose opinions and per perspective and worldview I appreciate. And um, I find that oftentimes videos that other people do that oftentimes they get off topic and they just talk and ask questions because they're trying to make sense they're trying to make sense of the world I find those to be sometimes the most valuable things to listen to and to think about because it's usually those that make you think the most. 
And I agree with uh, most of the people that are in that position. They have reached a point, similar to myself, where, and it takes a long time to get here, you get to a place that you never thought you would get to. You probably never saw this coming when you started down this path. A place in which you realize that it is entirely possible for most of the rest of the world and uh, most of accepted historical record is speaking against you and at the same time is not correct. Because, and you can say this, I think you can say this definitively, it's not correct, because the historical record as we know it today in many ways, and people in many parts of the world are doing their own part in trying to unravel this. What we see around us and experience today does not seem to reflect the world that they said existed yesterday. I'm not going into uh, Mandela Effect territory when I say that. What I mean is, most people <clears throat> who don't have phobias about being critical of everything, because they have reached that point to where their mind and maybe their spirit have they've been kick-started I think the two have to be started uh, together I don't think the one I think the one maybe the mind can work independently of the spirit but it's only going to I think it's only going to get you so far um, but I think optimally the two are kick-started together and they uh, you know they tend to take on more potential as you go. And uh, all of a sudden you find yourself able to think apart from all of the phobias that all of us usually have about questioning. Um, the chief thing uh, many seem to have a phobia about questioning is the Bible. Issues that they see or they have with the Bible. I think many people worry that when they do that, somehow they're, they're losing their faith or so, something. I don't know that that's correct. <clears throat> Maybe what you're doing, and, and what I'm doing, is we're losing faith in the systems we've been taught. That's probably all we're really losing faith in. This whole thing is more than likely a process that's actually bringing us to true understanding as opposed to just blind faith. So I know one of the things out of many things that we're having to, uh, to try to understand is for, for everybody who has any kind of interest in the Bible, uh, whether that interest be purely intellectual, whether that interest um, be like mine, where I believe this is uh, the last sole source of truthful information. At the same time, yeah, there's, there's corruptions to it, but I think the information is there. It's just that we might have to work uh, pretty hard to uh, discern uh, how it is there and what have been the 
unfortunate uh, corruptions. So one of those things that we have to, to look at, I think, is why is it that uh, most of, of what we tend to experience in our readings of the Bible, and some people uh, do it more in depth than others, but pretty much everyone, they have to deal with a certain reality uh, that the ideas, uh, the culture, and the world that seem to be communicated or described in the Bible, they don't harmonize with what we understand reality to be today. They truly don't. And so, it has created an opportunity for opportunists to design a world within the Bible that is very, very, very foreign to what we know today. <clears throat> We've got this idea that today we are advanced in many ways. Whereas I worry that one of the problems is we are regressed and that many of the techniques and technologies that are very useful are only available to some. And unfortunately, they're using these things to keep us in this unenlightened state in which, for one thing, we would, let's say, view the world of uh, the culture of, the people of, the God of, the particulars of the Bible in a way that is utterly foreign to our world today. I don't think that's an accident. Today we have cars that run on gas, machines that need <clears throat> natural gas and oil products to to run the type of energy that we get the electricity uh, that is produced and that we use I think is actually a strong regression backwards this is not an advancement I think that people who knows how long ago it was uh, they had very uh, natural understandings of how to utilize the materials around them and the environment around them, including the air and what was available within the air itself and the ground itself and everything. They probably understood how to utilize that energy far better. I mean, I don't necessarily think these people were advanced in the way that we might think of science fiction futuristic advancements, okay? It just that the technology they had, I suppose I'd say technology, was probably a lot simpler but smarter and worked far more effectively, with far less waste and uh, pollution, if you want to call it that. So this disconnect between reality as we know it and uh, the world that we see described in the Bible, uh, I think has a lot to do with the fact that the world that we live in is probably not as close to reality as the world that is preserved in, in the Bible. But the problem, partially, is the language. It's a big part of it. That's why the Obrey Project. 
So today I just want to ask a few questions and point a few things out because this is key. It's one of those keys to hacking away at the, uh, the synthetic matrix uh, that, uh, that fake reality that is a, a prison to our minds and our bodies. And one of the ways I'm going to do it, because I've thought a lot about this too. Now, this has been building for a long time, but at this point in time, I am only a sliver away from being absolutely 100% convinced that the events in the Bible described could not have happened in the Middle East. Not where they say they happened. Absolutely not. Now, we have to go by what we see described in the Bible. And not all of these outside sources. Because who wrote them? What were their motives? I would be skeptical. Um, I would be skeptical of really any kind of historical source and records. Um, because what most of them seem to do, they seem to be agents, um, and I mean the records themselves, they seem to be agents of uh, building a sort of a bridge between what is factual reality found in the Bible and what is the existence today that we are expected to believe is an extension of what we what we read about in the Bible when I say extension of just I guess f far in the future So I stay, I stay only with the Bible. The reason is because the more time I spent just studying in the pages of Scripture, the less the fake model of uh, what they want us to believe uh, as far as the locations of the Bible made any sense. The, the two were incompatible. And they only continue to become more and more and more and more incompatible as I go. And yeah, I still have a lot of questions. I'm not really in any way espousing myself as the answer man. This is just... It is what I study, the things that I study, and the way that I study them in. I never thought I would go down these paths. I really didn't. And I'm really surprised that I'm here. But there are things that I see that i got to talk about. I suppose if somebody wanted to make a case for the Middle East not being in an appropriate location for the events of the Bible, that they should probably start at the beginning, as close to the beginning as possible. So if you start in Genesis 2, you'll see that by way of the one of the accepted English translations. <clears throat> it says, concerning the Gan Oden, or Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.10, And a river went out of Odin to water the Gan, and from thence it was parted and become into four heads. The name of the first is Pishun, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Huila, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There's Bedellium, and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihun, 
and the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Hodquil, that is it which goes towards the east of Asher, and the fourth is Pereth. Now that's what's given to us about these four. Five, if you want to be technical, and we will. Now the first thing about this is, the translated word here is river. The source word is ne'er. Now, I have written in Obery, and it is left to right, not right to left, because it actually helps speed up uh, the learning process of any student who wants to understand the source language to put it in the common Western left to right format. It works just fine, and actually better. It takes away one very big learning problem when you have to read everything backwards. Okay, so from left to right, ne'er. Now, the other word that is so very often translated as river, sometimes brook, stream, valley, is nahal. What we have to do first is we have to determine what a ne'er is. Again, I don't have answers that are 100%, but I'm going to give you some ideas that we can hopefully work with. Most of the time, if I'm looking at an Obri root, it is a three-character Obri root. I'm oftentimes going to concentrate <clears throat> on the first two characters and see what the last character could be adding to it uh, by way of a suffix. That is not always what I do. The reason is I'm looking for patterns. There are not many instances that you're going to find with the R as a kind of common suffix that uh, produces the same result at the end of a two-character parent. As much as you're going to find the N as a very common prefix used on the front of words. Now, if you were to consult a suffix and prefix list, as per according to uh, the system of uh, Masoretic understanding. They would say the N at the front of the word means we will. I don't know that it always means that when it's used as a prefix in many contexts. I've looked at that thinking, wow, that's an odd, odd thing to do. And you'll also find that the N is oftentimes substituted for the first character of a short root instead of oftentimes the so-called yod, and it does change the word and the way that it's used. But the bottom line is that n is used as a singular prefix far more often than r is used for a singular suffix. Now this is important. It's also important with nahal. Like I said, the two most common uh, translations of Nahal is either as river or valley. <clears throat> if you look at it in context, you'll see that Nahal is more often more appropriate as river than just valley. Um, and there is a, there's reason to believe that when you see Nahal, there exists both, okay? A actual flowing river of water and a valley. And if you check geological, or I'm sorry, geographical, topological information, you'll find out that virtually every valley, 
except many in the Mideast and other arid regions. Nearly every valley is going to have water flowing through it at its lowest point, because it usually cuts a path through it as it flows out to its ultimate destination, which oftentimes is the sea, because the sea is usually the lowest level, it's lower than land, <laughs> thank God. So you have your Nahal, Hal, that root at the end, if you look at it just by itself, common. Uh, you'll find it as the root of many three character parents. Um, in a sense, meaning, I don't want to say it always means common. Um, but you probably get that sense the more you look at Hal and three character roots that have Hal as, uh, as its two character root. And I think the N at the front is appropriate as sort of the prefix to Hal. So, same thing with Nair. Now, admittedly, I don't know the exact nature of, or exactly how we're supposed to look at these characters as individuals. I absolutely don't believe the idea that each individual one is an exact concrete object like uh, the Masoretes would have you believe, or the rest of the world would have you believe. However, I do see the N so often as, uh, well, sort of the way it looks, I guess. <clears throat> if you understand, for one thing, that the last two characters in Nair is air, and air means a mountain or hill, and the last two characters of Nahal are Hal. Hal is common, and I think most people would admit that common would be very much a synonym or synonymous with low. So I think it's reasonable to assert that Nair could quite simply mean a channel cut from the mountain or proceeding from the mountain. You can see it in the N. Now the E and the R are characters that I haven't figured out how putting those two together are mountain or high wide rock. But I'm getting there. And I can tell you contextually, air works in that way because of uh, the kind of wording around air. You know that we're talking about standing on a great high natural structure. However, I do think it's entirely reasonable to figure that Nair is a channel cut for water proceeding from high natural places, mountainous areas, high natural places. High natural places are typically made of rock. And then the, the how it's, uh, I think it's, it's entirely reasonable to assert that Nahal is that um, river of uh, the lower lands. Now, does it proceed from a spring, or is uh, Nahal uh, simply a lower manifestation of what was a Nair higher up? I don't know. And remember, I'm not 100% on this. We've got a lot of different kinds of waters that exist in our world today because of where they come from, the way that they behave. Are they good water? Are they living water? Are they not clean water? Um, so there's a lot of differences. I'm just saying it's reasonable to conclude that Nair is a cut path for water in high places of rock. So mountains, um, the watershed is going to come from usually, typically, 
the highest places in the form of snow melting and all of the water goes down uh, forms together and when it comes together in a river then it proceeds <clears throat> I don't know if I don't know that that is every river of every high place that forms in that way and then proceeds. And there's a few things that we have to consider. When we consider these fornair that proceed from Odin, remember there is one nair. It's one nair proceeds from Odin. And from there, it becomes four, right? Right, well, because that's what the Bible says in Genesis 2. It says that there was one, okay? A nair. Well, it says u nair and nair, so singular, and nair, yitza. Everywhere you're going to look at yitza, and it's got that so called tsari in it, which denotes movement, yitza. Ma'oden le esh kuth athe gan. It's saying it moved from the garden. So it's reasonable to say that it is a river. It is something flowing out of it, and it's watering. That's esh kuth, making it to drink. So that's all reasonable. The the issue here is this. Whatever an air is, and remember it is moving, it is flowing, most of everything that moves and flows, I know the seas do, um, in ways, of course. Um, just about everything moves because of wind. But this is flowing and it's proceeding forth. And here's the thing. There is one nair that proceeds from the gan, and it becomes four nair. That is a geographical anomaly. Maybe not an entire anomaly, but, however, <clears throat> that's not what we normally see. Now, what the Bible doesn't say is what that one nair is made from. So that one nair could be made from, let's say, multiple watersheds come together. But of course, we wouldn't look at this as necessarily a rocky place, but it is probably one of the highest places in all of the land that we're speaking of, per se, because um, as these four nair leave the Gan, they go a very, very long distance, it would seem. And even one of them is often called the Nair Gadul, the Great Nair, and that is Parath, which does not seem to reflect Euphrates of today. But so it doesn't say if there are a number of watersheds that come together to create this first source Nair. It doesn't say if there is uh, some sort of a spring, a, a spring to these high places. Maybe that's the case. But we know that there's one, and then when it proceeds from the Gan Oden, it becomes four. That's an anomaly, because that, tem that tends to not happen. Because what tends to happen is, usually, tributaries come into the same river. And then it does not become distributaries until it gets to the delta. And this does not appear to be a delta whatsoever. This delta would have to be huge to cover the amount of land it would have to cover based on the lands that it describes, that it runs by, or 
the lands that we know these ne'er to be near or in proximity of from later on in uh, the scripture. So we can cross out delta too low, not big enough. However, I don't think we need to cross out delta as far as what that means by the Pishun and Gihun. You see, both of them are said to compass a place. It's et sabib. Now, I thought about this and I thought, well, maybe it means it runs by. I don't think that is the case. If it compasses the full land of, in the first case, Huila, and in the second case, Kush, then I would have to think that what that means is that it encompasses. It doesn't always have to mean that when you see Sabib, I guess, but it often does. If I punch in 3568 too, real quick, because this is, I think, probably an appropriate point to make. Okay, so here's the two reasons why I think that bo both Kush, which the Gihun is said to Sabib, or compass, and Huila, which is said the Pishun, was said to Sabib, or compass. Why that I think that that may be either a delta or these rivers are splitting off at a certain point. And the Bible is considering those two arms of that split um, to be compassing the land. Because remember, most of these places, uh, you'll see that in um, Exodus and uh and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you'll see that most of these different lands of different peoples, the water was the natural boundary. Mostly, it was water. Water were natural boundaries. If there weren't those waters for natural boundaries, there would be more issues between people. They created a very harmonious natu natural uh, boundary in many cases. But here's the reason why I think that both the Pishun and Gihun could at their, um, at their outlet to the sea, I would uh, assume they were going, but I don't want to overly assume, that they are very, I, I don't know, I would think very large deltas, and that both Kush and uh, Huila are within the, the deltas of these two, um, because... In Zephaniah 3.10, for instance, in just the English version, from beyond the Ner, Neri, see it's from Neri Kush, from beyond Neri Kush, Neri, not Nahal, not Nahalim, <laughs> Neri Kush, okay, from beyond Neri Kush, my suppliance the daughter of my dispersed shall bring my offering. So, the idea of many. And again, in Isaiah 18.1, Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond Neri Kush. And of course, any delta is just full of Rivers. Now, what's interesting though, Neri, it doesn't say Nahali. That's interesting because a delta is not a Nahal. A Nahal would be the water flowing through a valley, um, would typically have high lands or higher places on either side. Typically. I guess it doesn't have to necessarily though. I mean, the way that rivers are cut into land, especially over uh, really long distances, it doesn't necessarily have to be in, in a valley. Um, but the river has definitely cut itself a channel 
to work itself from one way to another. Um, I guess the big deal is the more um, the more planed out the land is on either side of that river, and the more meandering uh, the river is, is going to have a lot to do with uh, its floodplain, and oftentimes how good the soil is. So anyways, it does say Neri there in relation to Kush. So I think it's also reasonable that uh, both Kush and Huila were lands that were possibly um, encompassed by the delta of either the Pishun in Huila's case or the Gihun in Kush's case. Now, of course, that makes um, that makes a geographical problem for us right there. You see, they can't determine Kush, and they have all kinds of guesses that are awful. And, of course, when you show them how awful their guesses are and how they cannot prove, I've seen Bible versions that make one of the rivers the Nile, for crying out loud. If they had a single source nair and then they became four after that. One of them can't be the frickin' Nile. Okay? I mean, you don't have to be even first grade smart to figure that one out. But, you know, they've, they've toyed with, oh, one could be the Ganges, and one could be this, and one could be that. And we have satellite imaging now of old riverbeds that lead through here, there, and the other. I've even heard some preachers with a straight face say that they think maybe the Garden of Eden was once where the Persian Gulf is now. And I wonder if they understand anything about high places to low places river movement. You see, that's the reason why the Tigris and Euphrates empty out into the Persian Gulf, because that's the lowest place. Buffoons. So there's, there's that. That's an issue. And I got to remember something for the people that want to fix everything with a worldwide flood. Moses, who has been credited with writing Genesis. He is credited with writing Genesis many times. He speaks of these as contemporary. The Pishun compasses the whole land of Huila, where there is gold. It is present tense. It didn't <clears throat> was it's not saying they were or they did. They are. Believe me, unless you can go find it, there is no past tense in where these ne'er go. And we would have to know that the Gehun was still running its course in the time of Hezekiah, one of the latter kings of Yehuda or Judah, because he performed an engineering project that was so noteworthy it made it into the records of the kings and chronicles. Where, if you read most of the English translations, it says he stopped the upper water course of the Gehun and brought it down west of Jerusalem. I don't know if that's exactly right or not. If he diverted a branch of that nair. Um, stopping it, however, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Because um, I don't know that we're entirely appreciating the language being used there. Now, the people who say it was the Gihun Spring and that there were little guys down below al Quds with their pickaxes tunneling towards one another to bring a spring that only flows up when it feels like it and does not provide a heck of a lot of water. And there were a heck of a lot of people in that city, man. Let me tell you. 
Um, not the Gihun Spring. If it was the Gihun Spring, it would be called the Oin Gihun. <laughs> and there's one Gihun. Uh, there, not Gihun. Is it Gihun? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there's one Gihun in Scripture. That's it. The Bible does not make any kind of distinctions to another Gihun, especially not an Oin, which is spring. Oin Gihun. In that same chapter, you'll see plenty of springs Oin talked about. You'll see uh, Nahal that ran through the middle of the land talked about. I mean, why do you think Jerusalem had a fish gate? Unless perhaps they boarded the sea on their southern edge or at some point in it because it would seem that Jerusalem was far larger and more spread out and perhaps uh, bifurcated in some way. Uh completely unlike the Al-Quds, or what they presently call Jerusalem. So, if you've got one Nair, and then it becomes four Nair, you have to find somewhere that at least a singular river can be said to break into four. You see, you have to have you have to at least stay within those parameters. Right. The worldwide flood people. Well, as I said, the problem is it is written as they are written as contemporary. And a flood that magnitude, as they describe, I think would do... Uh, a lot of damage to all four Nair. It would reface all four and not leave two alone. I do want to point something out. So we have a single source Nair. Well, today's Tigris and Euphrates rivers, I want to read you. This page is uh, it's pretty informative, actually, from Britannica.com. And funny enough, most people don't want to talk about this. I've gone all kinds of places to get information on the Tigris and Euphrates. And so funny, they don't usually want to talk about this in depth. They don't usually want to give you really good, uh, sharp, clear, contrasting maps because the bottom line is the Euphrates and the Tigris have different sources. Different sources. It says here, Britannica, the two rivers have their sources within 50 miles of each other in eastern Turkey. 50 miles of each other. Notice, they didn't say they were 50 miles apart or anything like that. Within 50 miles of each other. I also want you to note that the same people who have uh, uh, an absolute, uh, very well-coordinated propaganda campaign that they put a lot of energy into trying to make us believe that the events of the Bible happened over in the Middle East. These are the same people that, on the other hand, since they do everything in secret, in the dark, on the other hand, they are doing everything to make us question the veracity of the Bible. Because they're only going to use it to their advantage. And they use very careful wording. And if you don't think Britannica has to do with these same people who are in control of the Middle East, you're fooling yourself. They word it like this. The two rivers have their sources within 50 miles of each other in eastern Turkey. Just imagine how close that is together. Within 50 miles of one another. They travel southeast through northern Syria and Iraq to the head of the Persian Gulf. Total length of the Euphrates, yada yada. Tigris, yada yada. Oh, and they are sure to tell you that the Euphrates in Samaria, it's called the Buranun in Akkadian, Paratu, Biblical, Parath, Arabic, Al Farat, Turkish, Farat. Just so you can see that these various different languages have very similar um, 
dominant consonants to the names of these. Same thing with Tigris, right? Because um, they're saying that the Tigris is the biblical Hadquil, and they'll prove it. Sumerian, Indigna, Akkadian, Ediklat, Biblical, Hidekel, Arabic, Dijla, Turkish, Dikel. So they're showing you they're, they're so similar in so many languages. Those consonants are very, very, very similar. Must be the that they must be the right rivers. So they said within fifty miles of each other. So what you have to understand is that yeah, they're within fifty miles of each other. Um, the problem is that the Euphrates um, gets its water from two other rivers that feed it. Okay, they are the source of the Euphrates. The source of the Tigris is a lake. And they are entirely different. So, they don't qualify. They don't qualify. Come up with any excuse you want. What you would have if you could somehow piece them together you would still have a number of watersheds coming together. Remember that the Euphrates is fed by two rivers. You see how we're not getting what we want. What we want is one nair that can be said to be parting distinctly into four. And these would be traveling quite some distance if you realize that Odin is mentioned later on in Scripture as being, um, we get at least a good idea of where it should be at. Um, and these rivers exist. Nair. But they're not the Tigris and Euphrates of today. And they also have the Gihun question to answer. They don't match up. The, the people who say they do, and the people who will smugly uh, giggle and treat people like they're stupid, cannot prove that the, the Euphrates and the Tigris have anything to do with the Perath and the Hadquil. Furthermore, it's kind of interesting the order in which they are named in Genesis 2. Pishun first, Gihun second, Hadquil third, Perath fourth. So which direction? Was this going in a direction? Was it from least to greatest? These are considerations. But no matter what you do with these considerations, the bottom line is that the Tigris and Euphrates of today do not in any way match up with what we should see in the Hadquil and the Parath. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. You can't find a single Bible verse that proves that either Babel was on the Parath nor that Nineveh or Nineveh was on the Hadquil. For everybody who espouses that, who is a student or supporter of ancient Near East studies, all you got to do is show me in the Bible where Babel is on the Parath or Nineveh is on the Hadquil. So from the very start, Genesis chapter 2, we don't have a match and I promise you it gets worse as we go so that's all I wanted to talk at you about today because <laughs> I can't talk to you um, I hope I hope you guys uh, for those who are uh, hearing this kind of thing for the first time or think this might be incredulous I would encourage you to look at it yourself just dis disprove it, you know, debunk it. Do searches. 
on the those four nair. Go to Genesis 2. If you have a decent a tool that you can do uh, pretty comprehensive searches on those, uh, you can either punch their Strong's number in, it, it'll show you all the verses that are in, and you can look at those. You can go to those in whatever your preferred you know um, translation of the Bible is, or you can use something like eSword and do a right click on the word, and it'll give you all the occurrences kind of in a pop-up list, which is really handy. I would encourage you to do so and check these things out for yourself. You tell me if they match up. So uh, until next time, I hope everybody take care.